Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston, downtown Honolulu here in our Think Tech studios with our show, Where the Drone Leads. And in the East Coast studio of Think Tech Studios Hawaii, uh, in Sturbridge, Georgia, we have standing by Dr. Mike Brown of One Way, One World, One Way. Mike, uh, welcome on board the show again. Thanks. And, 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 and uh, Ted, I, I'm in Stockbridge. Stockbridge. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll put you in the, in the stockade. How's that? In, 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 that that's sort of a halfway in between. And it's evident, Mike, that the sun has set on the East Coast, judging by the color of the of the uh, outside in the, in, in the environment there. But you have all blue going. You got blue lights. You got your blue kung fu outfit on. And so uh, night has fallen, and behavior deviations start to show up. <laughs> anyway, Mike, uh, hey, welcome on board again. And uh, Dr. Mike Brown is uh, an incredibly interesting individual who sees change in an interesting light. He sees change in the light of disruption and how we, how disruption needs to be, uh, disruption automatically accompanies new technology. It also has to be dealt with as organizations and users start uh, dealing with new technology. UAS, which is the subject of our show, or drones, is all about new technology. We happen to have one on the table here. One of our Thanksgiving table guests has joined us. It's a, a gateway professional mapping system, a UAS, unmanned air system or a drone. And the reason I have it here on the table is just to open the discussion that uh, Mike and I are about to have. But in the, in the show last week, we had a gentleman named uh, Michael Morrison and his associate, uh, uh, Kainoa Jimenez, and we were talking about the community involvement aspect. And the reason we need to think of community involvement and the reason we have Mike on is when we have something novel and different and new, such as what we're seeing here, uh, it has to be introduced into the user community and into the benefiting community in a very careful way to make sure that the proper uh, positives are understood and any negatives are uh, understood also and managed and kept out of control. In, in a very simple example, uh, if you saw one surveyor on your street doing some surveying, no big deal. If you saw two surveyors, they kind of come in pairs, that makes a lot of sense. If you saw 500 surveyors on your street, you might wonder exactly what's going on. If you saw one of these drones somewhere nearby, you might say, hey, one's okay. What if you, what if you saw 500? It's a whole different way to think, and, a, and, a, and there's a, 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 the, the incorporation of this in our daily thought process uh, has to be carefully managed. And that extends to the community of use of drones, which is going to be public safety, the environmental people, agriculture. Uh, all the organizations that can benefit from surveillance and from information gathered by drones are still going to have to deal with the community involvement and the incorporation of this kind of technology into their business operations just because it is novel and new and doesn't replace something that's already there. A better telephone replacing an old telephone, that's easy. But something like this, it does not replace something that's existing, but actually adds a whole new dimension of operation is can be frightening and certainly uh, stressful and therefore has to be properly managed. That sounds like disruption. And for disruption, you always turn to who? Dr. Mike Brown. Dr. Mike Brown of destruction. Black and blue. Well, there you are. <laughs> That's the consequence. Got it. So, Mike, you were just at the, uh, at the International Association of Emergency Managers meeting last week and presented to that group a, a view of the disruptive aspects that right. drones bring into the game. How did that go? It, it went well. I was a little worried because um, part of what I was trying to get across to them is this, is that right now there's a lot of frustration amongst emergency managers um, for, and public safety uh, individuals because uh, they're feeling as though they've been kicked to the side because they want what's on your desk right now. They're saying we need these tools because there's a paradigm shift, this new tool changes uh, the way that we can conduct all of our mission areas, uh, response, recovery, all of that. You know, it's, we know what it can do for the agricultural community, for the real estate community, uh, for all of those uh, 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 different areas. But what it does for us, we see as being life-saving and, and uh, it, uh, it adds to the uh, quality of life and helps us to mitigate uh, uh, certain issues by being able to have these. And so I'm hearing, uh, why do I have to jump through hoops to get the COA? And why is this exemption? And why won't my governor give me a waiver? And, and so they don't understand it. So what I tried to do at the conference was to explain to them in a way that they would understand what is occurring. 
and the method that I used was things that they are used to. Lessons learned, observations, and best practices. Now, everyone in the room could relate to that. And they were very excited about that. And I said, well, you know, you have to look at Congress. And what Congress is stuck with is what we call with bounded rationality. I said, I know that that's a strange comment, having rationality in Congress in the same sentence. I said, but the bottom line is we can look at this from a rational action uh, 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 perspective. And so I said, we're not going to go into rational theory. I said, but understand this. There's a couple of conditions that need to be met in order for you to make rational decisions. And I said, what they add up to are lessons learned. So when I started doing that, I said, Congress right now has no lessons learned. I think, I think the bell went off. So you're breaking this thing down to sort of an executable strategy as opposed to a frightening barrier. It's Yes, because what happened was, I, you know, they want to know why there's such a delay. Well, I told them that usually we are always complaining about having top-down uh, 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 applications where something is decided at the federal level and then shoved down our throats. And I said, as we know, all response, all uh, preparedness uh, uh, starts at the local level. The Stafford Act, it all tells us that we all learn this in academics. It starts from the, low, the lowest level, local level, and we appreciate bottom up. And I said, this is an opportunity right now for those of you who do have access, uh, who have met the requirements for Part 107, or co got your COAs, got your exemptions, and you're using these, start documenting and coordinating with the, with the National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center, with the, with the Ted Ralston, or the person who I call uncle, Start connecting with the National uh, Disaster Preparedness Training Center and, and FAA. They're not your enemies. What we're doing right now is we're in a period of structured lessons learned. And, and if I can inter introduce sure, to please. another comment there, community involvement. What you just spoke of is about six different communities that are all involved and in some way relate and overlay on top of each other. Uh, right. Not completely, but to a certain extent. So what you're saying is involve yourself with all of these. Be open. Be communicative put information out, including things that don't work, failures, problems, let them be shared as well. Learned. That's lesson learned. If, if, you, you, if you're going to do it, look, I, the, the two examples I used, and it resonated with them, was the, uh, in the 1970s, uh, we had duck and cover, and then we had on the other side, with civil defense, we had the national, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, natural disasters. Remember, the governors got together and said, we got a problem. You're giving us all this money for duck and cover because we might get nuked from mutually assured destruction. What we really need to use this federal funding for is for natural disasters. Can we do that? So they developed a dual use system where they said, okay, you can use this funding. And there, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter came around and then we've got FEMA and bada bing, bada boom. So we developed a system where we, we, we learned. Well, that happened again. Uh, the most significant time that happened was fire scope with the firefighters in California where they left their egos at the door. Uh, they said, look, guys, we've got to pull our resources together in order to try to deal with the situation. But they learned. There was a lesson learned. Well, that's what we're doing now. But this, this time it's more structured. What's happening now is that Congress has said You're, the whipping boy is the FAA. Let's stop whipping them. What they've done is the best they can. They've issued us a couple of guidelines some policies that we can deal with and they're going please work with us to tell us how we should approach this because there are so many alternatives how do we deal with protection of privacy how do we deal with the retailers and the manufacturers that want to sell these items how do we deal with the people that want to use these for recreation and then how do we deal with these people for 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 uh that want to use these for public safety well all the alternatives and different issues are out there they, those have to be weighed in what's called a cost to benefit ratio, not necessarily on econ economic uh, um, um, of standards, but also for social standards, which means the values. Some people value uh, uh, their privacy and don't want their neighbor to be utilizing a drone. Well, when, these, when Congress finally gives us a law or some guidelines, 
everybody, all these situations have to be weighed so we get the best possible law for all those six different layers of the communities and players that you were talking about with the most benefit. Not now, everybody's going to win. What we have to do is identify that benefit somehow characterize it, write it down, and put it in simple terms so people can understand it. I like the point you made earlier about uh, the FAA having been the whipping boy for ser several years here. Now FAA came through and has made massive changes. They put the 333 exemptions on the street two years ago, put 107 on the street this year, an educational interpretation. The FAA has done all they can, and they're actually doing even more. Uh, right. Our state here in Hawaii, along with uh, Oregon and Alaska, is involved in one of the FAA test centers. There's seven across the country. So issues at IAEM or the International Association of Chiefs of Police or any disaster agency can bring forward to us the test dates, can be turned into test programs to go find that relevant information about how Ted, that device Ted, gets used. Ted, that's part of the problem. Um, one, a question came up from one of the persons that was in the audience. And he said, well, Dr. Brown, let me ask you, if we do this and we have these observations, and I, and I, I told him, I said, you know what, these seven test centers is one thing, but that's a controlled environment. What George Purdy did recently, your guy there at the airport there at Lanai, that's, that's fine. And we need that information because that gives us an idea of how we can oper operationalize and, and functionalize certain ideas that we may have but there's nothing better there's nothing that can replace a firefighters or an emergency managers an incident commander's actual observation during a real incident or disaster because those are things where they're not calculated they're not scripted and what they do in that situation is something that can be shared with all of us because we learn from it the problem is there's no pipeline, direct one policy-making organization that's a repository collecting all this information. Sure, we can talk with the FAA, we can talk with the, with the, comport, with the consortiums for National Disaster Preparedness Consortium, a lot of those. But there needs to be one organization that filters this in, brings it in, and is able to... Uh, do a, three, a throughput and put this information out to, oh, they would be great with using it. Oh, this should go here. Oh, that has to do with this, and this should go here. Or that should go to Las Vegas, to, the, to our group there that's dealing with uh, CETOS is issues, nuclear Mike, issues. Let's, 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 let's do this. Let's take, uh, say, One World, One Way as an example of an agency that could uh, assist in, in promoting this idea. Let's figure out, after we get back from our first break here, let's figure out how we're actually going to do this. Let's take on the task that is the open gap right now as us after we get back from our first break. Sure. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Aloha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech. Wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Texar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. We are back, folks, for the second half of our show, Where the Drone Leads. Today we have Dr. Mike Brown of One World, One Way in Stockbridge, Georgia our East Coast studio. Uh, as you can see, the sun has set on the East Coast, hasn't quite set here, as you can see by the background. Anyway, Mike, welcome again, and, and, and thanks very much for that stimulating conversation. We just talked about it a bit at the break. Your idea was that the gap of, of communication and understanding, in, 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 and you're about the only person I, could, I know who could see it this way, but that is such an important issue, part of the community involvement expressed in the What's, how good is this thing for me? How can it work for me? 
What are the issues? How am I going to make something like this novel and new go forward? So what we're talking about before the break is the gap, the absence of a repository, a place where on a safe basis, everything associated with the use of drones in the world of emergency management, for example, could be collected and could be sorted, could be shared, and the p things that work shared and understood, the things that don't work advertised as well. So people can begin gaining the, the, the experience, the, the muscle memory of how this stuff really ought to go. Right, that's right. So uh, we were just talking at the break is, you know, we have a lot of other new technology that's come in like uh, social media and stuff. I don't think in social media that we necessarily have that mixing box where everything gets to come in and get sorted out. I think we probably in the social media domain call that the marketplace. Things that don't work don't survive in the marketplace. Things that yeah, you do... can ask Samsung about that. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> you can ask Samsung about that, their phone. <laughs> well, there you go, right, yeah. Now, of course, uh, really old people like me don't do social media, so we're not really, we, our information doesn't contribute to the, to the, uh, the DNA right. increase here. So what are we going to do, Mike? How are we going to get, uh, in fact, why don't we do this? You had the meeting with IAEM. We had a similar meeting, you and I together, with, and Steve Johnson, Steve Jensen as well, with NFPA a while right. ago. We have a right. meeting coming up Tuesday with the International Association of the Chiefs of Police. I think we're right. going to head in the same direction. We right. get three major organizations here. Uh, would they have any place where they come together and share thoughts? Would they, as three organizations, be interested in owning this box into which we deposit this kind of experience? Well, of course they would. You know, I reached out to the Atlanta Police Department here, and I asked them if they had, had, if they had drones. And even though Georgia has a law, a, sta a state law now for drones, uh, for UAVs, the Atlanta Police Department has not yet adopted the use of, of drones. Uh, same thing with their fire department. It's quite a large fire department and uh, police department, but they're, they're not utilizing it, even though the state has already implemented a, a law. On the contrary, uh, all, you know, uh, Chicago was one of the first major cities to come up with a, um, I think I sent you a copy of that, of their drone ordinance that they're using. So there's a kind of a disconnect. My interest with the chief of police would be this, that there are some gaps in what they call the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, Th that needs to be updated. Um, that law needs to be updated to include uh, violations and use of new technologies so that they can have access to certain tools uh, in order to investigate and prosecute uh, acts using that. So that's one of the laws that I think Congress needs to look at, and that needs to be brought up during this uh, uh, chief's meeting. The other issue is, you get these organizations, the IAEM and the International Association of, of uh, Chiefs of Police and uh, the National Fire, but none of these individuals, there's not one specific place within FEMA uh, or within the consortium where they can download and send and format uh, videos and or narratives of their incidents uh, of, that they've been involved in or their exercise and say, look, this is what we found out. That would make for an excellent, excellent live. And that would be a no fault, uh, no no foul type issue. You, whatever That's it is, right. you report it. You know, there's yeah. an interesting situation. About 15 years ago, either the FAA or the NTSB created a a no no foul, no harm type reporting system for aviation. Whatever right. you did that might have deviated from the rules, or whatever you experienced, observed, or saw happen, or caused yourself, you could report it. And there was no recommendation for it. There was nothing coming back to you. It was simply a data point that went into a, a, a box of some kind. And then decisions were made about where regulations need to be changed, where training needs to be changed, something like that. So we're ta you're talking the same thing here. It's been done before. Yeah, it, it, you know, and that, that's one of the things every day across the country, there are different situations, no matter how small they are, that are utilizing that tool that's on that table in front of you. Well, these are things, a lot of this is being lost. They're filed away, nobody ever knows about them. Look how we're doing this now. We could have a repository, and what needs to happen is that it needs to be interactive. Someone on the other end, or a group, needs to review this information and get back with them and say, look, we appreciate your input. It was wonderful. We saw this. Uh, we have another question for you. Let us ask you this. And from that, you start to build an actual algorithm of narrative 
technical and narrative, qualitative, where you can see where you really can filter and get the best. You know what, Mike? This is starting to sound like an intelligence situation, just like uh, you and I have talked about before. We're talking about semantic analysis of multivariate narrative and such. We're talking right. about correlation and deconfliction. All the rules of, right. of intelligence play out here as well. That's and, right. And as you know, this is such a as all the ideas come from you are are you know beyond the the limits that we're used to. So this this is this is shocking and incredible at the same time. Oh, and cut it, up, man! I ain't got that much money. Okay, we have one one more guy who often is at this table named General Daryl Wong. Same thing. We limit him to two bright ideas per show because we can't handle any more than that. But. Uh, <laughs> What, what, this, is, this is critical for the nation, this very discussion that you're leading and this idea you're taking us into. Well, what, but it, well, here's, another, here's another way that it works well, because if, uh, if it's tied into Congress's database, they do research constantly. If it's tied into their research in the, the, uh, uh, the GAO, Government Accounting Office, they would have access and be able to go and look at things that are being done. In other words, they could review and look at these lessons being learned and observations as they were trying to get together to develop laws going forward in the future. So it would help them as well. But it would be one central place where public safety could de deposit their experiences uh, that they thought were noteworthy, having to do with new technology, stingray technology, uh, um, in other technology, I, I've been, I'm a big proponent of the Communications Act of 1934 is completely outdated, and it doesn't allow, uh, under the FCC rule, for any use of jamming technologies. At some point, we're going to realize that with this new technology in front of you and others, that the, some of our intelligence agencies and some of our national security agencies will have to be able to use some technologies that we are saying are forbidden. You're giving them to individuals so that we can fight an asymmetric battle uh, uh, of changing things. I mean, that thing in the front of you is a wonderful tool, but it's also a platform for disaster. And I, you've heard me state that once before. You saw what happened with the president last year uh, when the Secret Service had to stop the one guy in, in Hawaii uh, uh, from flying the drone. There's a reason for that, you know. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, they slapped uh, C4 on a robot and sent it in a room and uh, got rid of a problem. Well, they could do the same. You know, somebody that's nefarious can put C4 on a, on a UAV and put it in. And our national security apparatus and our public safety need to have the tools that they need in order to address the probability that something like that will, be, that will happen, particularly since it's easier to get a recreational drone than it is for our public safety to this get is, the... This very issue you're speaking of, the, the malicious use and this sort of thing, would fit that same pattern. It's a, it's, a, it's, a pat, it's a data identification and pattern recognition situation, and that same intelligence system that would collect the issues associated with positive and negatives of use in disaster operations would in, have a, a section in it that deals with this malicious use. So you could use that same system to collect those factors and those, those indicators of emerging patterns. Right. So, okay, Mike, so um, we have an obligation, I think, between the two of us to take this story forward. Uh, you know, I was just thinking as you're talking, um, and I don't want to put anybody on, on the spot here, but we have been talking with our partners in Alaska about using our congressional delegations to, in a shared way to see this picture and start taking, some of, start taking an interest in some of these issues at, the, at, at that level. I, I think that and you're, you're correct on that. It is the, that's the level that has to occur. And uh, uh, in fact, all of the, I, I would, should say, in fact, all the work in getting UAS into the business in the first place was, really came out of Congress. FAA took care of a lot of actions, but they were mandated by congressional acts and by the uh, Revitalization Act of the FAA. Yep. So right. that's where it starts, that's where it ends. It's in Congress, isn't it? Right, well, the, the, and we have some friends in Congress. I've mentioned uh, uh, Charles Schumer. Yeah, uh, he's Senator Schumer. Yeah, Senator Schumer. Uh, um, um, he has uh, introduced acts, and he's he's looking to push uh, geofencing. And the question came up last week when I was at the conference about geofencing, and I I avoided the question to some degree. I I um, don't like going into to uh, certain technologies because I believe that 
those particular geofencing is a key, a very key uh, uh, technology that will put us in a position to protect critical infrastructure and also to strengthen NIPS or the National in Information uh, uh, and um, Infrastructural Protection Program um, because they got to be working hand in hand, and that's something that I haven't seen um, lately, and that would be under PPD eight, PPD twenty one. Um, but I think the, the main issue is Congress has their hands tied too, because none of those gentlemen know as much about the instrument on that uh, table in front of you as the people that are actually using it. And they're waiting for us to give them ideas, ways and means and lessons learned. They have to, you can't make policy or laws based on, well, you know, no if I can inter intercept your thoughts for a minute, Mike, which is, uh, is uh, the second, you've given two brilliant ideas on a table and that's the limit for the show. We don't allow more than two, as I mentioned, because it, we just can't handle that many more bright ideas. But, uh, but the, the, as an analog of that, what the FAA has done with these test centers is exactly a, a small scale version of what you're speaking of. The purpose of the test centers is to find out what works, what doesn't work, what the issues are, what fails, and where the success has to be done, either technology or in regulations. So the model is there. We've seen that model play out several times. And uh, this idea you've got of taking a story to Senator Schumer, let's do it. Let's obligate ourselves right here on TV. I, I reached out, I reached out uh, the week before last. I haven't heard anything back, but I did reach out. The problem with the test centers, uh, Uncle, is that those test centers like I said, and I stated before, are those are controlled environments. We and can fix that. They, we, we'll take that challenge and go fix it. My yeah. God, that's, that's what we're you, all about. Got those that I can guarantee you the same scenarios that they're using and that they're putting out there, given in the real-world situation, there are going to be three or four other variables that pop Amen. up. That many, many more variables. No question about that. What we and can do is... That's the, and that's the thing that, you know, you per, you're preparing. You say you got your... You got your... You got your you got UAB under air operations. You got all the resources. You typed ready. You got everything set. Everybody's re ready for the next window, next for the next period. Everything's fine. And then you get a, a telephone call that there's four or five drones because a, a little group of teenagers are out there and they're all trying to suit and get the best picture of whatever it is that's happening. Now you're ready for one. UAV, but you're not ready for five. Right, and or, or 500. And in fact, the whole world of counter drones all about that. Mike, we're, we're, uh, we're right. reaching the end of our, uh, our rope here in, uh, in the show. Uh, I, I, again, I can't thank you enough for the, the brilliant ideas. We'll see you on the telephone on Tuesday. We talk to the, chief of, the chiefs of police. And let's follow up on this idea of at least starting to, to present the idea to our congressional delegation and to Senator Schumer at the same time. Well, what I want you to do is reach out to the uh, National Disaster Preparedness Consortium and see if they can have a policy report repository. We'll do that. We've already suggested that to them many, many times. So we are out of time at this point in time. Uh, Mike Brown in uh, Stockbridge, Georgia, and his wonderful family standing by off camera. Uh, you may now return to your 1030 Friday night activities, whatever they may be. And uh, <laughs> Okay, Mike. <laughs>